I love his character parts, even though he was usually made up to look kind of goofy or older. But I was also extremely delighted when I watched all his roles as beatniks and gangsters on the Private Eye series. He was on between 1960 and 62. I also loved his role as Count Manzeppi on The Wild Wild West, very much since he got to play an attractive gentleman villain. I completely agree, Larissa. That particular character, Count Manzeppi, was one of Victor Charles's very best roles on television. Count Manzeppi brought out the real Victor Charles as being the witty and hilariously funny person he was. In 2015, I visited with my Uncle David Francis and his family in Lakewood, California, and within their family room, there was a painting of Victor Charles as Count Manseppe hanging on their wall. Did the fact he often looked older bother him? Did it ever lead him to any funny or strange situations? I remember writing in Victor Charles's black Cadillac with him. He was behind the wheel driving through Malibu Beach, California, on the way to the cigar store where he purchased them. When we got there, I'll never forget walking through a crowd of shoppers with Victor Charles that day. He was tall and large, and the expressions on the shoppers' faces made me want to laugh. It appeared to me that they never saw a man like him, with long hair and a beard, and he was gracefully walking with the spirit of a royal king while mingling along with his common people. Being by his side was like being on a huge ocean vessel, cutting through the rolling waves. People seeing him stepped aside. Did his size and age look bother him? When he was growing up as a young boy, I think he would say, yes. But as an adult, he knew what he looked like, and he knew who he was. And frankly, he couldn't give a damn what others thought. You just mentioned two more movies Victor did with Robert Aldrich, and another question I had written down is in relation to that. I've read that Aldrich signed Victor to a five-year, five-movie contract, uh, but did they only do three together? What happened? That is definitely up to one speculation to what happened between Robert Aldrich and Victor Charles. Aldridge first directed Victor Charles in Whatever Happened to Baby Jane, then followed with Four for Texas, and then Hush Hush Sweet Charlotte. I haven't read any news clippings explaining why Robert Aldridge and Victor Charles never worked together again. My hunch of why their creative relationship came to an end was due to a disastrous motion picture, The Strangler. Victor Charles had the leading role, but it brought him only shame and embarrassment by the poor qualities of that particular motion picture. Soon, Victor Charles was box office poison, and that might be the reason Robert Aldrich never cast him ever again. I also read that Aldrich planned to produce a TV series called Mr. Man, in 1963 that was supposed to star Victor as Sherlock Holmes, Nero Wolfe style detective who plays a harpsichord. It said they had already filmed a pilot. I was so sad that the series never happened. It sounds really great. Do you have any idea why these projects didn't happen and why he stopped working with Aldrich? My answer to why the television program Mr. Man never was televised was because of the motion picture The Strangler. What it appears to me is that the commercial investors financing Mr. Man yanked their financial support away and in doing so, the project was dead. And I believe that is the true reason why Robert Aldridge never worked with Victor Charles ever again. When looking back 
on Victor Charles's film acting career between October 1962 and December 1964 was the most substantial body of work that he ever did. Victor Charles was working with giants like Betty Davis, John Crawford, Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin in those three films that escalated his value tremendously. And a short time later, he starred in Dean Martin's The Silencers, released on February 18, 1966. And it was then when Sinatra Deems Rat Pack dissolved their relationship with Victor Charles, and they never worked with him ever again. Later on, in July 14, 1972, Victor Charles acted in The Wrath of God, starring with Robert Mitchman and Rita Hayworth, and it was directed by Ralph Nelson. Those were my favorite motion pictures he acted in, and it's a shame he hadn't made more quality films, and for the rest of his acting career, it didn't go kindly for him. Maybe you can tell me a bit more about the way Victor's career went. I only know it from outside about the projects that actually happened. Maybe you know more about his motivations to take certain roles and what he thought about them. My uncle Victor Charles never discussed anything about his acting career with me, but after I became an actor, director, playwright, and theater critic in over 30 years, I can assess how his acting career had worked out for him. In the beginning of Victor Charles' acting career at the Oak Globe Theater, it was a community theater at that time, during the 1950s and early 1960s. Going up to Hollywood in those days was completely different from now. Motion picture studios brought up amateurs and unknown actors and actresses to polish their talents and turn them into money-making investments. If a potential actor or actress failed in three straight motion pictures, they usually would be released from their contracts and would be forgotten. Earning enough money was always on Victor Charles's mind, and most of his decisions of what roles he would play were strictly motivated by the need of money. He definitely had his share of cheesy B-grade productions, and if he wanted to remain as a professional actor, he had to put money first and quality second. That was Hollywood in those days. I also wondered about Victor's political attitude and general convictions, because I know he was a Roman Catholic, and his piece, I Am, can definitely be read as an anti-abortion message. He also had a Christmas show, and in general, his protest against nudity on the set of The Strangler, making it seem like he was actually a practicing Christian. Whenever talking to my Uncle Victor Charles, it was never about politics or religion. What was discussed was only day-to-day -day thoughts like, what's for lunch, mother? Or, have you spoken to Davy this morning? Never did I hear a word spoken about politics at the Bono kitchen table. That goes the same for practically every family member in those days. We just didn't talk about politics or religion. Never. Being a Roman Catholic, it would be easy to conclude that he would be against women having legal abortions. But if he was still alive today, I believe he would have a change of mind by realizing women should have the right over their own bodies. Never did I ever hear him speaking about any controversial topics of religion and politics in my presence. As for nudity in motion pictures, I personally believe nudity was quite enjoyable for Victor Charles. 
He definitely wasn't a prude or, or shy of sexuality. The most important person in Victor Charles's life was his mother's opinion, and that is probably why he frowned when he was being in a film that had nudity. Also, I would guess, he never had an intimate sexual affair with a woman in his life, and it possibly made him very uncomfortable seeing it before his eyes. I didn't know about this rule that if you failed within three motion picture productions in a row, an actor would usually be forgotten. I have read many hardback biographies of motion picture actors and actresses like Tyrone Powers, Douglas Fairbanks, Marlene Dietrich, Elizabeth Taylor, Cary Grant, Gloria Swanson, and on and on with others. During the 1930s into the 1950s, Hollywood studios like MGM and Warner Brothers would bring in new talents to discover new superstars. Many of the actors and actresses were green behind their ears, and the studios coached them and had them sign a three to seven year contract. Usually, if their first three motion picture roles were poorly evaluated by audience fans and studio executives, then that actress or actor would die on the Hollywood vine. Once again, Hollywood's primary reason for being in the entertainment business in those days was for making money. If the new talents didn't attract and inspire paying audiences, they would soon be gone just like that.